Welcome to Industry Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. Today is Friday's show, so we're talking tech, namely IDC wearables data, since the numbers are hot off the presses. I am your host, Dylan Lewis, and we're doing something kind of special today. I am joined on Skype by the research manager for wearables and mobile phones at International Data Corporation, Ramon T. Lamas. Ramon, how's it going? It's going pretty well. Thanks for having me here today. Yeah, so earlier this week, you guys released the quarterly update to the market share data for wearables, right? Mm-hmm. Always a lot of fun to put together. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's a lot of fun for, for us to digest. I have to say, like, this is kind of a cool moment for me. When I reached out to your PR guys about possibly getting something going on a regular basis, uh, I was not sure how enthusiastic you guys would be. But, I mean, you, know, you, got, you said you were a big fan of The Fool. We're obviously a big fan of your, uh, your research and the stuff you guys put out on a quarterly basis. So it seems like kind of a match made in heaven. Personally, I've been a fan of The Fool since 1995. Oh, so you go way uh, back. Yeah, yes, yes. I have all the books and everything. Wow. Yeah, that's the early gardener stuff. Um, so just to get started, you guys are kind of like the definitive source for a lot of uh, the device shipment estimates that the market uses to kind of get a broad stroke look at what's going on. Uh, can you give some background on how you guys collect your data and what the methodology is there for our listeners? Sure. You know, we, we take a number of approaches. Um, fortunately, because we had a lot of expertise in gathering this kind of data in other uh, device categories like mobile phones and PCs and tablets, uh, we leverage a lot of these same relationships we have with these vendors uh, to get insight as to uh, how the previous quarter has been doing. Um, in addition, we have a number of connections with uh, channel checks, distributors, um, suppliers, uh, component uh, providers, that sort of thing. So we can better triangulate how different vendors are doing and how the overall market is shipping up at any given quarter. So it sounds like if you get one number maybe from a manufacturer, you can kind of gut check that against what a supplier might be telling you as well. And that's exactly what we do. Cool. Uh, and in addition to all these you know, external uh, um, you know, checks that we have, uh, we have a number of internal teams that say, listen, you, know, you may be getting this number, but I can tell you by my conversations uh, with some of the other uh, people in the ecosystem that uh, you know, the numbers may have to adjust slightly higher or slightly lower, but you know, it gives us just another area uh, another, uh, you know, defense card, if you will, uh, for us to say here, uh, we can gut check things one more time. Cool. Well, let's dive into the numbers that you guys came out with uh, earlier this week. So for the wearables market, and this is smart watches, fitness wearables, anything kind of in that spectrum, uh, you guys estimate 19.7 million units uh, in this just recently closed quarter. That's an increase of 67% from the 11.8 million units shipped during last year's first quarter. Um, that's down sequentially 27.4 million, but no real surprises there, right? I mean, the holiday season's a big boom. Holiday season is a big boom, and, and you know, a lot of vendors were hoping that the fourth quarter of 2015 was going to be the time when, oh, hey, look, you know, a wearable, the greatest gift that you can give during the holiday season. Um, so the first quarter of 2016, yes, we're, we're expecting some retrenchment, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, we saw a lot of activity. You're, you're seeing a number of uh, companies being bought up. You're seeing a number of companies trying to realign and re-rationalize their strategies. Uh, and unfortunately, we saw several companies uh, bow out of the uh, market altogether. So for a market that's just about four, maybe five years old, uh, still lots of activity going on here. And just a rundown of the top players in the space right now. Uh, so Fitbit was in first place in market share. Uh, they had 4.8 million shipments. According to you guys, good for 25% of the pie, roughly. Uh, Xiaomi, the Chinese manufacturer, was in second with 3.7 million and just under 20% market share. Apple in third, 1.5 million, and uh, but just under 8% of the market share. Um, so just a quick rundown of the things that really jump out, to me at least. Uh, Fitbit's market share is down year over year and sequentially. And you know, the year over year isn't terribly surprising because last year's first quarter, Apple wasn't in the market yet. So that, that's a natural chunk that's just going to be taken right out. Um, but is Xiaomi the culprit here with what we're seeing on, uh, on a sequential basis? Because, you know, I see that their market share hasn't really flipped all that much, but they're up sequentially. Well, you know, it's not so much the sequential growth that I'm really, you know, kind of concerned about because at that point we're really looking at the seasonality of the entire market. So going from, you know, busy fourth quarter where everybody's giving these things as holiday gifts down to uh, first quarter of retrenchment, we're, we're expecting that kind of, uh, you know, activity. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you take a look at the year-over-year -year growth from a year ago, I mean, 
yes, you know, Apple wasn't out for during the first quarter of uh, 2015. So we'll, we'll put those guys aside for a second. But you take a look at, you know, Fitbit, uh, you know, up 25% year over year. Xiaomi up, you know, more than 40% year over year. And now we're talking about real growth opportunities. Uh, you know, again, that takes out the seasonality. It kind of makes you say, hmm, you know, here's a number of vendors, you know, growing a number of different ways. Uh, number one, you know, new devices. Number two, uh, new distribution channels. Uh, number three, you know, new markets that they're spreading into. And that's going to be, you know, the, the part that I, you know, tell the most saying, yeah, you can have, uh, you know, a, a fourth quarter, you know, post fourth quarter slump. But altogether, if we're seeing the market showing, you know, consistent year over year increases, uh, and look, we're doing it at a strong double digit clip, um, that pretends, uh, you know, some good news, uh, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future. One of the things that I was really struck by was the others category. So, you know, outside of the top five in terms of market share, uh, all the other manufacturers that come into play there. Uh, so a year ago in 2015, they made up about a third of the market and they're actually up a uh, quarter, uh, year over year, up to 37%. It's not a huge move, but, um, you know, I was kind of expecting consolidation as this market matures. And I guess, you know, it's not quite there yet. It's still very nascent. But um, any color there as to what's going on in that lumping of others? Well, you know, here's the thing, you know, with this others category, that encompasses a lot of different types of devices uh, that have been coming out. And it's easy to point to things like fitness trackers that go on your wrist or, or, or some sort of smartwatches. Uh, but now we're looking at a number of different, say, products and form factors like smart shirts, uh, smart workout shorts, smart socks for crying out loud, <laughs> um, smart jewelry, um, you know, smart eyewear and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, head mounted displays. You know, there are a number of different categories that are coming out, you know, en masse. Uh, from a year ago, and and yes, they're taking up more market share. At the same time, we're seeing a lot of copycat type vendors. I mean, for every Fitbit device that comes out, you know, there's a, at least a, a couple hundred other you know copycats and Me Too's and wannabes that do exactly the same thing. Uh, it just doesn't say Fitbit on them. Right. So uh, you know, we we got to give uh, you know all these uh, you know markets. Uh, you know, uh, contenders and followers and, and fast followers and pretenders uh, to firmly establish themselves over the next uh, you know several quarters or even years for that matter uh, to see you know where the market's truly going. And that's part of the fun of tracking a nascent market, right? Is uh, seeing how it all shakes out. Yeah, exactly, because you know, it, first of all, if we rewind the clock back, you know, let's just say in even ten years, so that puts us back to what twenty sixteen, you know, pre iPhone, and uh, somebody says to you, hey, you know, uh, in a decade from now, we're going to have a brand new market, we're going to have brand new. Um, uh, you know, brand new vendors getting into it. Of course, you know, my knee uh, knee-jerk reaction would have been, um, yeah, you know, maybe we'll see Apple and Microsoft and Google and 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 and, uh, and and all the you know usual suspects. But if you take a look at this top five list, you know, these are not, uh, you know, there's some vendors over here, and as well as you know, hosts upon hosts of other vendor names here, you've never ever heard of, guaranteed. And uh, because we're here in the U.S. You probably won't hear of them ever again either, um, but that certainly says to uh, you know the the forces of this market and the power of local manufacturers and OEMs to get into this market as well. And to your point, it's actually been kind of surprising the lack of success that some of the really big entrenched tech names have had. You know, they, you look at what Samsung's done, and they've been more or less flat in this market. Um, you know, and you've had these upstarts or these uh, kind of low end manufacturers, your Xiaomi's coming in and just taking huge swaths of the market. Exactly, exactly. But you know, with re, uh, with respect to Samsung, uh, yeah, you know, volumes, uh, you know, changed, you know, not uh, you know, not too much from a year ago. Uh, but if you you know, lift the hood and uh, and you say to yourself, you know, okay, how has the device changed? How has their portfolio changed? And you take a look at what they used to do in terms of just uh, you know experiments with different flavors of a watch and what different features work. Now they got something ro much more robust. And uh, much more sophisticated and, and, and stylized, um, and it's been a very popular watch with uh, carriers because it has cellular connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, you got a, a company, as you point out, with Xiaomi, great growth year over year. Uh, guess what? The vast majority of that company's volumes are still ending up in China, uh, and these are fitness trackers that go for about what between twelve and fifteen dollars. Incredibly inexpensive. Sometimes they're bundled with a smartphone as well. Uh, so again, you, you lift the hood and you take a look at you know number one the products, but number two, you know take a look at that distribution strategy of how some of these uh, devices made it out the door. Really interesting time to be in this market. Yeah, and so I'm glad you brought up Xiaomi and their efforts in China and how really I mean that's the bulk of their business, ninety selling percent of their business at this point, right? Um, you guys take a global look with this data, and so all the market share numbers we're talking about here are worldwide. 
Are there regional markets where demand is particularly strong, either for one brand like Xiaomi or um, just there's a huge appetite for this type of technology? You know, it, it's, it's really, um, it really comes down to, to three uh, markets. Uh, one is China. Um, another one is um, the United States. And the other one is Western Europe. So if you grouped all the England, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, and, and some of the smaller markets there, you know, we're starting to see, you know, similar numbers, uh, you know, at least on a top line basis. Now, if you talk about the different brands over here, you know, here in the U.S., we can talk about the Apples and the Samsung, the Fitbits and, and the Garmin's. No problem. Um, when I was taking a look at the, the Chinese list, you know, in just the top 10, I didn't need, I've never heard of some of these vendors that, 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 are, uh, that are over here. I mean, yes, you see your uh, Xiaomi's and your Huawei's, but things like LifeSense, um, XTC, uh, Aberdeen, I mean, things that you and I might not even recognize and, and even have a hard time trying yeah. to find on a Google search. But, you know, this is what's, uh, this is what's happening there. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so you know, that, that kind of says to me that you know, there's space to move, uh, there's space to grow, um, but I, I think uh, you know, I, a number of these markets, uh, you know, we're starting to see uh, you know, challenges to the potential you know, global order. Mm -hmm. um, does it, why, does it have, why does the world have to belong to a Fitbit or an Apple uh, or a Samsung? It could be done, you know, it can be homegrown and, and in some cases a lot less expensively too. Is there anything looking back at this most recent quarter that really surprised you in the data, or has it been kind of more of the same? Well, you know, it, 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 a lot of people ask me, you know, so what's going on with Apple? <laughs> and, and, and everyone uh, wants and, to know. It's the biggest market cap company oh, in the world. Well, well, oh, Google they, they trade back and forth with Google, I guess. But yeah. true, true. <laughs> but I mean, if you take a look at this top five list, do you see a single Android Wear vendor on it? The answer is no. Um, so, you know, let's, let's just fast forward to Apple and say, okay, you know, one and a half million units. And you take a look at that number, um, and then you take a look at some of the comments that Tim Cook uh, mentions on the uh, earnings call, and he says, you know what, Apple Watch, it meets our expectations. And I say, wow, meets your expectations. So let me get this straight. You know, if Apple Watch meets expectations with one and a half million units, and, and don't get me wrong, it's a lot of units comparatively speaking to other, other uh, you know, vendors and devices out there. Um, if you take a look at that and put it alongside the challenges and the other products, because um, we know that iPhone you know, saw a year-over-year uh, -year decline, uh, tablets have been on a steady decline, PCs decline or, or almost flat, you know, with, with the watch, with Apple Watch, it's still not there yet in terms of volume or in terms of revenue to offset the declines of Apple's most popular products. Um, and that, that gets my attention, uh, you know, quite a bit. And especially if uh, Cook is saying this is meeting expectations. Um, that says to me a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, you know, if it meets expectations, you know, obviously that means expectations are low. Uh, number two, um, the Apple Watch in its current form is not going to be the be-all, end-all. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I think in, the, in a couple of years, we'll look back in this first iteration of the Apple Watch and say, my, my, you know, wasn't that a quaint little device? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, more development is warranted and it's on the way. Okay. Um, and, and the third piece over here is, is that uh, if, if you take a look at, the, you know, Apple as a whole, uh, and, you, and, I, and I say to myself, hmm, you know, where are all the investments being made? Um, you know, especially, you know, we always talk about, you know, things that happen under Steve Jobs' watch and now under Tim Cook's watch. Um, you know, what does this mean for Tim Cook's, you know, first, uh, device, and what does that mean for you know future devices? Our expectations going to be you know unreasonably high, uh, you know rationally uh, you know lower, or somewhere else in between. Um, so there are a lot of uh, fun questions to ask about that. Well, I will say bless you guys for giving the market some idea of what is going on in terms of shipments, because Apple has been notoriously opaque about providing anything in terms of volume. So I, I can say, and I'd like to speak for a lot of people by just thanking you guys for giving us a number to try to hang our hats on. Uh, um, no problem. Thanks very much. You talked about functionality a little bit, and you know, like you know the idea of the current iteration of the Apple Watch being uh, you know kind of a cute product compared to what we might be seeing down the road a couple of years. You, something that your team talks about quite a bit is the idea of bifurcation in the wearable space, and you know the market being segmented into these two different groups: uh, these very robust smartwatches, or what we think of as robust now, and then these more bare bones fitness wearables, and. I've always been of the mindset that that's not going to coexist forever, but it seems like it's still holding right now. 
you know, it's exactly holding right now. And, and I think it's a good way to think of it as, um, you know, two products that, you know, potentially compete against each other. Uh, for me right now, I think they're necessary conditions in order to expand the overall wearables market. Uh, with these bare bones, simple, you know, fitness uh, wearables, you know, there's, there's a huge segment of the population that really just gets it. They can open up the box and slap it on their wrists or, or clip it onto their belt and say, oh, okay, I know what this does. It just tracks my steps. And, and they can, you know, grok that. They can wrap their brains around that, you know, rather easily. Uh, but, you know, for, for the smartwatch market uh, right now, a lot of questions as to you know, what uh, problems do these devices solve? Um, and why do I need it when I still have a smartphone that does just about everything that I need it to do? Um, so, but I think, you know, having growth in these two categories, that's great because we're going to be addressing two different market segments at the same time. People who just want simple, people who want a, a couple steps ahead. I think when we, if we fast forward the conversation, uh, you know, a few years from now, and we can take a look at this and say, aha, um, you know, how much uh, legs does you know, a fitness tracker have up against a smartwatch and vice versa. Uh, because at, at that point, we could take a look at, at the different kinds of functionalities that could be incorporated into each um, and uh, and what price points and what uh, distribution that we're going to uh, see for them both in order to make it out to the market. Yeah, I think the lower price point wearables provide a nice entry point for people that think they might like wearables, they might want a fitness tracker, they might eventually want a smartwatch, but they want to try it out and see how long they really use it. You know, you do this, hear, hear those industry horror stories of uh, fitness bands just collecting dust in people's drawers, you know, after six months or something like that. And the, the wonder with consumers about, is this something I'm really going to use? And so it is nice that there's that low level there. I do wonder if that'll blend a little bit more in the future, though. Well, you know, here's the thing about this wearables market, also being, you know, a nascent market, is that, you know, where does change take place? Change takes place on the fringes. It doesn't take place, you know, right directly in the center. And so, you know, where change is taking place the most right now, and it has been for the past several years, is uh, has been with fitness trackers. Again, you know, people get it. And now what do we see on the edge right now? Well, it's a smartwatches. <laughs> because it seems like the natural evolution, but you know it's going to take a while for these things to you know get into the center of the mass market and, and see you know widespread adoption. Now, while at the same time we see you know we we have great expectations for both uh, smartwatches and, and fitness bands. Um, you know, let's not overlook all the other product categories out there. I mean, we, we snickered a little bit when when we brought up you know smart clothing, um, but you know I think that's an area that's going to have a, you know tremendous growth potential. Um, same thing with smart eyewear and same thing with smart earwear. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see things taking off, uh, you know, from that point. And now we got to stop back and say, hmm, you know, approximately how much of my wear wardrobe is going to be smart? Yeah. And who's going to bring it to me? And am I going to like it? And am I going to want to pay for that price differential between paying, like, say, you know, $15 for a T-shirt versus $40 you know, hypothetically, uh, for a T-shirt that tracks my uh, tracks my vital, uh, uh, you know, health data. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten to that point, but it, it's going to come. Expect it. So, a couple of companies that are really playing in that space or are looking to, uh, whose names are not currently in the market share conversation, at least you know among the top five, uh, that I think of are the more traditional fitness companies. So, Under Armour and Nike. And so their efforts in smart tech, I think, are still very limited. They're kind of in their infancy. But do you think there's a point, possibly in the not so distant future, where we start to see their names coming onto this list? You know, here's the thing about the companies like Under Armour and Nike, and, and, and just to you know toss on a couple more, um, New Balance, uh, Reebok, Asics. Uh, considering that you know health and fitness as a category is is, is the low hanging fruit for the wearables market. Um, I wholeheartedly expect these vendors to get into the space and make a lot of noise. Uh, because if you take a look at it, you know, the, the blueprints are already there for making apparel and clothing of all different kinds. Now, you know, ask yourself, you know, what does it take for, for, for vendors to make, say, uh, you know, uh, shoes and sneakers smart? Well, I, I'll probably say, you know, not too much, maybe, you know, a number of sensors, but I think it can be done. Uh, these companies already know how to make clothes, particularly clothes with, uh, you know, compression fabric. So you get a nice tight, uh, you know, wrap around the body. Um, you know, these companies know a, a thing or two about that. Um, they also got a very strong brand with, you know, ardent followers. I mean, look, if, if uh, you know, and just to, you know, show my uh, local regional loyalty, uh, Tom Brady, who has a stake in Under Armour, comes out and says, hey, I got this shirt. It's smart. It'll track all your statistics. 
you know how many you know New England Patriots fans like myself will probably line up and get those things. Oh, uh, Ramon, we were getting along so well <laughs> until you dropped the Tom Brady reference. I'm a, I'm a Jets fan, so I have to take a little bit of an exception to that, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> what if Darrell Revis came out with a shirt like this? Yeah, yeah I'd be on board. <laughs> there you go. Well, now, yeah. well that, that's something we can agree on because he played for both of us, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you know, here, here's the point is that, you know, I, it, it's not going to be long until uh, these vendors that we listed, and, and along with many others, either number one, you know, come out with something on their own, or number two, partner up with somebody, uh, you know, to bring in all the, the electronic and technology smarts uh, to be paired up with the apparel and expertise uh, to bring out some, uh, some, port of, so, some form of athletic uh, clothing and apparel uh, that people are really going to want. Excellent. Uh, so, Ramon, before I let you go, I have to get some more forward-looking stuff from you just because I have you on the line. Uh, so every time I look at your data, and this is something we kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, I kind of have to have in the back of my head that there's this lumpiness to some of these numbers because it's a nascent market, because the calendar for product releases aren't maybe as standardized as you'd expect with smartphones, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. Are there going to be any things that look weird sequentially or year over year or anything that we can kind of anticipate in the, for the current sales quarter? You know, like that someone will grab a bunch of market share, but we should know that because they have a product coming out or anything like that. You know, I, I think your question is so timely on multiple levels, and, and here's why. Um, you know, this week, uh, Google I.O. 2016, and uh, I'm sure they're, they're, they, you know, they've talked a lot about Android Wear and, 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 uh, and, and showing a lot of uh, features and functionality over there. Um, in a couple of uh, weeks, you know, Apple with a, a Worldwide Developer Conference, WWDC, they're going to be talking a lot about the, their roadmap. Chances are Apple Watch will be getting uh, will, will getting some uh, you know prominent placement over there as well, uh, and then if you take a look at some of the other announcements that we saw from uh, the Consumer Electronics Show (CES) uh, back in uh, January in Las Vegas, and then more recently uh, Mobile World Congress or MWC in Barcelona back in March, a lot of those products that they were showing off at, at, at these uh, you know, these tech shows, they're really be coming out you know middle of the year you know. Q3, you know, time frame. And guess what? A lot of them look really pretty. <laughs> a lot of them are, uh, you know, incredibly functional. Uh, you know, some of them are iterative of what we've seen before. But I'm also going to bet that, you know, 2016 is also going to be the year that we're going to see some uh, new features that we haven't seen in the past or not get enough of uh, recognition in the past finally start to bubble up to the market. So stay tuned. Any, anything in particular to keep our eyes peeled for on the, on the feature Ooh. side? I'm going to give you my, my, my two favorites. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my number one favorite, um, it, it's, ha- it's a smartwatch with uh, cellular connectivity. Okay. And, and here's why. It's, it's because uh, up until this point, virtually every wearable you put on your body uh, has to go through your smartphone, right? And for a lot of people, you know, that is a non-starter. Uh, it, it's one of the classic uh, responses of, well, why do I need a wearable when I, 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 I already have my smartphone? Okay, fair enough. So how about if we make your wearable, you know, connect to uh, your cellular network, use the same phone number that you've had before, you know, just, uh, you know, just, just don't have to, you know, clip to your, uh, you know, smartphone all the time. Yeah, you have an independent about, device there, right? Think about what that opens, Dylan. It's incredible because now, you, you know, you're wearing a device and uh, you can leave a smartphone at home or maybe it's lost or maybe it's you know sitting on your desk charging at home charging or maybe you just gone next door to the neighbors or playing in the back ra- uh, backyard with your kids um, but now you're you're you're, tr- you're completely you know untethered you can still get messages you can get, still get phone calls if you need to so you know you can be dick tracy if you'd like to uh, <laughs> but you know all these you know applications that kind of start up that uh, you know say for instance that you um, you and I go on a bike ride Okay, and, and we're coming back after after a good twenty mile bike ride, and uh, you know we're, we're turning the corner, we're heading for home, and you, my wearable uh, is talking to my IoT enabled house, and uh, it says, okay, you know when I'm a quarter of a mile away, open the garage, or you know when I'm this close, uh, you know turn on the lights or something like that. Why? Because you know my watch can tell, can can ping the network saying, Ramon is at this location, and it's you know IFTTT. If this, then that. <laughs> Uh, and, and it just you know it, it just snowballs from there, and, and so we're going to see a lot of things in terms of you know, consumer experiences like that, in terms of uh, um, oh gosh shopping. You know, think of it this way: what if I you know, look? I'm a creature of habit. I go to the same stores all the time. Uh, but what if I go to let's say you know my favorite uh, 
uh, my favorite liquor store. And instead of being in the usual area to get my favorite beer, I'm in perhaps another area getting a different beer. And uh, because you know, I opt into you know all these you know fan sites saying uh, saying that yeah, I want to be a follower of your brand. What if that brand senses, hmm, Ramon's not in the usual spot looking at our stuff. Why not? And boom, you know, they send me an instant coupon on my uh, on my smartwatch. The the hyper local advertising approach. Bingo, <laughs> bingo. I mean that that's crazy, uh, but that's also a lot of fun. And yeah. also, uh, you know, consider what this means for you know uh, uh, connected health. Okay, it, uh, in, instead of you know going to the doctor you know once a year and, and perhaps quote unquote lying or bending the truth uh, to the uh, when, when the physician asks the question how you've been feeling. Well, you can lie in and say, I'm feeling great because I want to get out of here <laughs> as quickly as possible. Well, what if the doctor says, you know what, uh, Dylan, I, I got your data here that I've been tracking from your, uh, from your smartwatch. I see, you know, on these, ep- uh, these times during the past uh, six months, your heart rate was elevated or your blood pressure was elevated, things like that. What's going on? The sensors don't lie. The sensor, well, the sensor data doesn't lie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the sensors, you know, I, I think they're, 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 that's another story entirely. But I, I think, you know, when you put it all together, you know, with, with cellular connectivity, you know, we can track, you know, people, you know, where they are, um, what they're doing, um, and also how they're feeling. And that's going to open up a lot of applications. So big possibilities. I'm looking forward to seeing how they pan out. Yeah, you know, bring it on. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Ramon. I'm hoping that this is uh, the first of many times that we're going to have you on Industry Focus. It's pretty great to have you. Me too. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Well, listeners, that does it for this episode of Industry Focus. If you have any questions or just want to reach out and say, hey, shoot us an email at industryfocus at fool.com. You can always tweet at us at MF Industry Focus. If you're looking for more of our stuff, subscribe on iTunes or check out the Fool's family of shows at fool.com backslash podcasts. As always, people on the program may own companies discussed on the show, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against stocks mentioned. So don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear here. Thanks for listening, and Fool on!